Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here or you've been sitting in the shadows and you start to enjoy what you are hearing, please punch that subscribe button. And while you're at it, punch that bell as well. Make sure that one sets all. That way, you know every time I upload, which is every day. Also, if you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all of that information can be found in the description box below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story. There will be an ad. Yes, the first story is always short for everyone that keeps complaining about it. We do that so we can get the ads out of the way and you can enjoy the rest of the video. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Back when I was 18, working in a fancy hotel, there was a maintenance man. He was quite handsome, hardworking, and funny. Over time, we created a friendship, and I found myself comfortable around his presence. After a few months, he asked me out on a date. We ended up going for dinner and then for some drinks. I asked him what his last name was, and he replied, it was White. I thought nothing of this, and we moved on. The next day at work, I noticed that his name tag actually revealed his last name was Morrison. I never questioned this to him, but immediately found this to be very strange. When I got home, I told my mom, who immediately said, uh, red flag. A few hours later, she comes up to my room with panic, saying that the very man I went on a date with had beat someone to death when he was 17. He bullied and chased the younger victim to a dead end, where he acted out a prolonged and vicious attack that was so severe that the victim had to have a closed coffin. My mom is an avid investigator when it comes to these things. We never went out again, but I did have to see him at work, which made everything very awkward. A few years ago, a friend of mine from school also stabbed a man to death, and another friend punched someone in the face, and they died as a result of injury. Back when I was 18 or 19 years old, I was house-sitting with a girl I was studying with. The family we were house-sitting for went to the same church as her, but I didn't really know them well myself. It was more to keep her company in a huge house. This was 1997 when the average teen like me didn't have a cell phone. During the week that we were house-sitting, it was a short break in the school calendar, which is why his family was away and why the streets in the area were quieter than usual. My apartment, as well as the house we sat for, not far from the university. My apartment was actually a three-minute walk from it and the house a further five-minute by car. So, being a student neighborhood, it was particularly quiet this week. The first weird thing that happened the week I was at the house was that I dreamed I was driving through a dark forest on a windy, hilly, dirt road with no headlights anywhere except for those for my car's headlights. As I started to go down a hill, the headlights suddenly cut out and everything went dark. The car stopped down to a stop and died. And then I woke up. In the morning, I went out to my car and it wouldn't start. It had been working perfectly the day before. I had to call a guy to come fix it. It was the starter motor. Well, that was the first creepy thing that happened to me that week. A day or two later, it was Friday and I planned on driving back home to my parents who lived in a smaller town about 45 minutes away. 
I packed up my stuff at the big house and was going to head over to my apartment to collect whatever else I needed for the weekend. That trip between the house and apartment was, as I mentioned, only five minutes or so away. Since it was winter, it was dark by the time I left at around 7 p.m. As I was driving from the house, I noticed in my rearview mirror the headlights of a car behind me, tailing me really closely. When I turned, it turned. Back then, I was cautious, but not overly so. Cautious enough to notice in such a short distance that something weird was going on behind me. But then when I pulled up to a traffic light, it wasn't there anymore. Relief. Short-lived. The car was now beside me. I looked to my right, and there was a man inside, alone, smiling at me, slightly maniacally. For a moment, I thought, geez, should I really drive with a beanie on at night so people can't see me? I'm a petite five-foot-two female with long blonde hair down to my waist. I also thought, well, he's in the lane to turn, so I'm good. I pulled off, and the headlights were behind me again. So close, I could barely see them over the back of my car. What an ass, I thought. Who drives like that? Thank goodness my turn is coming up, up on the left, soon. After another minute or two of this tailgating, I slowed down strategically didn't indicate and made a sudden sharp left into my driveway opened the automatic gates and shot inside the gates closed behind me yay that drama was over i gathered a few things from the car to take up with me and noticed on my way over to the stairwell that there was a man at the gate that had just closed behind me he was still on the other side, and I was at the far end of the parking lot. But I couldn't make out it was the dude from the tailgating car. He was jumping up and down, shaking the gate with absolute rage. Well, I was safely on the side, so I wasn't completely gripped with fear. And besides, there was a group of students making a noise nearby arriving for a party or something. I headed to the stairs and started going from basement, ground level, to the first floor. Rounding the stairs on the first floor, I noticed someone running across the parking lot towards the staircase. In hindsight, I still can't fathom why I didn't put two and two together. I guess it's because I subconsciously I knew there was the group being let in through the pedestrian gate. As I was rounding the staircase between the second and third floors, someone suddenly touched me. I spun around. It was the guy. He had slipped in as part of the small crowd. He said something. I said something sassy back and told him to F off. Then I turned my back on him to continue up the stairs. I lived on the third and last floor. He grabbed me from behind, held my back against his chest with his left arm around my neck. I felt something being held against my right side. Ah, shit. A knife. He led me down. I remember thinking there was a light that was broken on the bottom level. This can't end well. But I was calm. I resisted slightly. He tightened his grip, though. I felt like I wasn't getting enough oxygen. I started to become dead weight. He started to drop me. I was groin level. I elbowed. It connected. He dropped me, but spun around to face me, ripped the front of my button down top. Then he stopped. He looked at someone behind me, someone taller than him. His eyes went wide. He turned and ran. I screamed. Then I, too, turned around to see who had come to help. There was no one there, but people came out of their apartments after that. The police were called. This was the second time they were there that night. What the hell? Turns out the other weird thing that happened 
was that my dad had already called the police and they had come past an hour before. My mom had a weird feeling all evening and had hassled my dad endlessly that something bad was going to happen to me. She had been right. As it turned out, they caught the guy. I identified him in a lineup. He was a serial rapist in the area. He was accused of rape something like 14 women. One had thrown herself out the first floor of her apartment to get away from him and broke her leg. Weeks later, the police called me. Before his trial, his cell door had been left open. He was gone. Apparently, it was an inside job. Oh, quick edit. I kept the more graphic details of the actual encounter on the stairs out of the story, so as not to distract from the creepy aspects. This happened about six years ago to me and two other friends. I was 14 at the time of this story and we were seeing the new Jumanji. This was my second time seeing it, but I was super excited because my mom had decided that I could finally start getting dropped off when I hung out with friends instead of her accompanying us. After she dropped us off, we went inside, got our tickets and snacks at the concessions, then went to decide where we wanted to sit. This was before there was the assigned seating and you could just sit wherever you wanted to. Of course, being teens and wanting to be on our own, we sat in the back so we would not interrupt the other movie watchers with our snickering and jokes. There weren't that many people there, maybe like three groups of kids and various other adults around them, but I did not pay much attention to them. We just started to be on our own. Soon after we were settled, the trailers started, and that's when he walked in. I did not pay much attention to him then, but I still noted that he was the last person to enter the theater. I can still remember exactly how he looked to this day. He must have been in his late 20s, maybe early 30s. He was Caucasian, had dark eyes, reddish brown hair, and a short beard. He was wearing running shoes, jeans, a white baseball cap, and a jacket over a t-shirt. He did a quick scan of the theater, and he stopped with his head in our direction and started making his way up. The steps all the while, he remained fixated on us. We were one row from the very back, and he sat directly in front of us, right in front of my friend, who was sat in the middle. This was the first of many noticeable red flags. Soon after that the movie started, I immediately tried to focus in on the movie, but not long after it started, the man started twisting his hat, so at times it was facing forwards, then backwards on his head. That would not have been a problem if it wasn't for the fact that every time he adjusted his hat, he would completely turn his head to stare at us, then smirk for a few seconds, then turn back. It continued on like this for almost the entirety of the first half of the movie. He would then giggle to himself, quietly, even if the movie was in no way comedic. The vibes were just so off on this guy, boarding on Sinister. By then, I had completely lost interest in the movie and remained on focused on what he was doing. Soon enough, he changed creep tactics, and every time the movie characters told a joke or said something remotely funny, he would full-on belly laugh and turn around towards us while laughing and making direct eye contact with each and every one of us. After that, he got tired of that one, so he would stand straight up and rotate to face us, smile creepily, then sit back down. I was literally so tensed up that I had stopped eating my M&Ms and now my friends had started exchanging uneasy glances with me and I could tell that they were just as uncomfortable as I. 
I remember clearly my friend on the left grabbing my arm as the movie was getting closer to the end and whispering my name nervously with widened eyes. I replied with, I know, I have been watching him. I had decided to start coming up with a plan. I already knew that the employees here were unreliable, so I decided to trust the only other thing I could think of without my mom there. Women. It was almost the end of the movie, and I turned and grabbed both my friends' arms and whispered to them as quietly as I could. Guys, the moment the credit starts, I want y'all to run to the bathroom, and I am going to call my mom to come here and get us, okay? They nodded, both looking as terrified and uneasy as I felt. About five minutes later, the credits started, and the moment they did, we fucking bolted as quietly as we could. Of course, in my mind, every horror movie scenario was playing in my head with me being the last to leave the row. So when I got to the bottom of the stairs, I decided to do the dumbest thing I could have done. Please go easy on me. I was young and stupid and scared. I stopped and turned around as my friends ran ahead of me to the bathrooms. The theater was empty now, except for him, in our row, crawling around and looking under the fucking seat. This felt like it lasted for a couple of minutes, but could not have been more than a couple of seconds. I was just petrified. I couldn't move at that moment, but believe me, I started moving again when his head popped up from the end of the row, and after a jerk motion scan of the room, his eyes focused on me. I swear his eyes were so wide, I could see the whites from all the way down there. That's when he got up and started running, and so did I. I bolted out of there, skidding on the slick carpet, and shot my way to the women's bathroom, which was four theater entrances ahead of me. I could see my friend peeking out the side of the entrance as I got closer. I noticed that my other friend was not accompanying her. After I could speak again and was semi-breathing normally, we headed deeper into the stalls, and I shakily asked her where our friend went. She told me that instead of running into the bathroom, she shot off to the concessions where there are sometimes employees. This might have been my first option if I didn't know my theater well enough to know that it was a 50-50 chance for any employees to be there at that moment. We then calmed down a bit more, for we were now in the noise and crowded bathrooms surrounded by other people and adults. After like four minutes, we decided to take a peek out of the entrance to see if he was there. And I kid you not, this motherfucker was pacing back and forth in front of the entrance with the most angry look on his face, staring directly at me when I poked my head out. I still don't know why I didn't tell any of the women around us what was going on. We finally called my mom, close to tears, and told her what was happening. She immediately left the store she was at to come pick us up, as she could hear we were very upset. After waiting a minute more, we decided to take another look outside, and thank God, he was gone. We saw our friend standing near the front of the theater next to an employee. Turns out, she had just been standing by the worker and watching the man run in my direction, then pace in front of the bathroom, then finally leave. She never said anything to the worker, which I thought was stupid then, and thinking back, it's even stupider. But we were dumb. We waited for my mom to get there, around the employee who never said anything to us and was probably confused as fuck. We finally saw her car pull up and raced out to it and told her to drive out of there quickly. After telling her what happened, she told us we were probably overreacting and he maybe thought we were cute and we were the ones who misunderstood the situation. Still kind of pissed at her for that. 
very ignorant of a very knowledgeable and usually understanding woman, but maybe she was trying to comfort us? I don't know. All I know is that man did not have good intentions, and we had every right to be as afraid as we were. Just thinking about it gives me the same goosebumps as I had in the theater. I know if I saw him today, I would know exactly. Stay safe, everyone. Always trust your instincts, even if you think you're overreacting. They're usually pretty right. Hello, all. This happened when my best friend was 17 and a half, and I was 17, in 1996. My best friend, Chrissy, and I are both smaller females. She is 5'4", and at the time weighed 110 pounds, but was a soccer player, very athletic and strong. I am 5'7", and at the time I weighed 125 pounds. We are both blue-eyed and blondes, and were often asked if we were sisters or cousins. There is a large reservoir on the outskirts of town, surrounded by a beautiful public park. We figured we'd be fun to walk around in the park because lots of people go hiking there. I had gotten some really good quality weed, and we were looking to find a peaceful place to smoke some out in nature. I had my pipe ready in my pocket, and we were stoked. We chose to go out on a Saturday. It was beautiful. Sun was out, and there was not many people there. We parked my car by the reservoir in the most vacant lot that had two cars. We did not see anybody when we got out there. We walked around the water for a bit and then chose a trail to go up. It was about 80 degrees out, and we were sweating, but we had some water in my small day pack. As we got about a quarter mile or so into the trail, I started having a weird feeling. I looked at her and quietly asked, Hey, do you feel something is off here? Everything is really quiet. Where there were usually crickets chirping, frogs singing, it was totally silent. She looked back at me and said, Yeah, I, I think so. And then we heard some crackling of leaves about 60 feet behind us and a bit to the left. We did not see anybody at that time, so we continued forward. We were both getting pretty nervous and we heard the crackling again, this time a little bit closer. We still did not see anyone. Each time we would continue forward, we would hear footsteps a little bit more behind us. I thought we were being stalked. There was a turnoff to the left, which led to a clearing by a large rock about 12 feet high, with a large, sturdy rope anchored onto it, so climbers could climb to the top. It was part of a steep hill side of the cliff. The rope to climb it was anchored to the ground as well so no one could not move it. I told her, we need to get up that rock. We need high ground now. She nodded and went up first with me right behind her. We flew up that rock, clinging to the rope tightly and going as fast as we could. When we reached the top, we turned around to see an older man, probably about 45, with slider build, wearing a jacket, jeans, and glasses, coming into the clearing. He was about 20 feet away. He looked at us with a cold, vacant expression. I got goosebumps looking at him. I shouted, Hi, will you please leave us alone? We're trying to have some privacy here. He made no response, and with a blank expression, slowly started walking towards the rope, which led to the top of the rock. My friend at this point was really scared and asked, Oh my God, what do we do? I saw a large rock, about eight inches and almost squared to my right, so I grabbed it. I was surprised at how heavy it was, but my adrenaline was going, so I lifted it easily. I told her, Look around for the biggest rocks you can find. 
fast. Move them next to us. Hold the biggest one. If that guy tries to come up, we throw them at him and hit him as hard as we can. Aim for his head. Fortunately, there was a pile of sizable rocks behind us to the left. Like someone had made a ring to hold a fire on top of the rock and then move them away. She brought a few over and held a large one herself. My friend and I stood close to the edge of that rock, holding our makeshift weapons. I looked down to the base of the rock where the guy was considering the rope. He looked up at us again with a very cold, blue eyes and no expression. Then he reached his hand for the rope. I shouted loudly, Do not come up here. If you try to come up here, you're going to get really hurt. We are aiming for your head with these rocks. Get the fuck away from us, man. I held the rock close to my chest so he could see it. My friend was next to me, doing the same thing, and we had a pile of more rocks. He blinked his eyes and cocked his head a little bit, then released his hand from the rope and silently backed away. He backed to the edge of the clearing, back through the brush, still watching us, and then we heard his crunching footsteps go back through the woods until we could not hear him anymore. We stayed on that rock for another 20 minutes, maybe a little bit more, watching and waiting. There was no way to access the rock except for the steep hillside covered with poison oak, so we did not think he'd try it. And plus, we'd be able to hear him if he did. After we didn't hear anything for 20 minutes, we decided to make a break for her car. We threw several rocks down to the ground. Mine hit the dirt, with a particularly satisfying thud. Chrissy went first down, while I was keeping watch, just in case he came back. When I was scaling down the rock, she was holding a rock, getting ready to throw it in full force if he returned. Fortunately, he did not. We each grabbed the largest rock we could carry, put a few smaller ones in our pockets for good measure, then headed back to her car on the trail, very carefully and quietly. The crickets were chirping again, so we felt that he had left, but we were still extremely cautious. We did make it back to the car without incident and quickly left. That was the last time I have ever hiked in that park. I want to begin by clarifying that the majority of this story is a prelude to my actual upcoming amateur investigation. What I'll be documenting in this story is essentially a compilation of stories I've been told, some retellings of others, and also what little I've already checked out myself. I will not claim validity to any of the accounts I'm about to give you. All I can be certain of is that I trust dearly the person from which I continue to get a lot of these stories, as they are the mother of a close friend I've known for over 10 years. Honestly, some of this stuff gets a little weird for belief, but I intend to put that to the test however I can. The place I call my hometown and current town is a Kentucky County comprised of old coal mining towns that, at one point, had a bustling economy. Let's call it Arling. Unfortunately, coal mining died a slow and painful death, and so has my home. This saddens me greatly. Arling is one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen, nestled into the heart of one of the oldest mountain ranges on Earth. The Appalachian Mountains have a tangible natural spirit to them. I also believe they are host to a variety of things we do not understand. I, along with my girlfriend and roommate, often hike on old trails around the county in hopes of finding interesting sights to see. 
We are always looking for somewhere near to hike far out into the sticks. I had a friend of mine ask me of his work buddies if they knew any of my rural pathways to test out. One of them mentioned that his father had hiked a path ascending a mountain beside what we call the Old Lake and that the place scared him to death. The Old Lake is part of a forsaken WMA or Wildlife Management Area about 10 miles outside of town toward the state lines at the base of Mount Mason. The government property lines only go so far. Beyond that is private land owned by a local wealthy family, presumably abandoned as well. The man's father told of how he had once hiked along the ascending trail that follows the creek from the lake and up into the mountains past the WMA boundaries. I will refer to this trail as Lonesome Creek. The man crested a hill and prepared to briefly rest upon a flat spot. He quickly took notice of a shady campsite that had evidently been set up on the flat for some time. The site was unremarkable at first glance. Nothing there but a fire pit surrounded by wooden chairs, but he could just barely see something else beyond the tree line. It looked as though someone haphazardly poked big sticks into the surrounding forest. A closer look revealed that what he was looking at were pikes staked into the dirt and adorned with several cat heads. The man's hair raised up as he felt something out there put its eyes on him. He quickly put distance between himself and Lonesome Creek, and never again so much as visited the old lake. After hearing this story, it dawned on me that I had been told something similar years ago. This story, too, implied possible ritualistic activity on Mount Mason. As it goes, a mutual friend and his cousin had taken their ATVs on Lonesome Creek at night. Sometime into their ride, the pair spotted a makeshift sitting area right in the middle of the trail. It was shabbily constructed with a few chairs as well as something like what a preacher holds his Bible on. A Bible, maybe? Even more frightening was a recently doused fire in front of the pulpit. Someone had been there just before they arrived. The two riders killed their engines and unseated themselves, looking around the ridge for their flashlights. As the silence soaked in, they could make out faint voices just beyond some trees on a steep incline near a ridge. Needless to say, they didn't bother shining their lights and left in a hurry. They probed no further. Remembering this incident was enough to make me look deeper into this harrowing mystery. The occult aspect of Appalachia has always intrigued me. Everything from folk magic to the blackest of practices pervades the history of the hill folk and their, predominantly, Scots-Irish ancestors, whom immigrated long ago. In the spirit of curiosity, my girlfriend and I took a midday ride up to the back side of the old lake, opposite from the frequented dock side where many families boat and fish. The road was in rough shape, and upon arrival, it was obvious from the massive amount of trash that the Department of Fish and Wildlife had begun abandoning this WMA. We walked up the seemingly well-traveled path against the downward stream of the titular creek. After reaching the marked end of the WMA, approximately half a mile, we decided it was wise to go no further. The sheer seclusion of the place pulled me in, but I needed to take time to plan carefully and gather up a few willing folks to walk along the old Lonesome Creek Trail. A quick check of Google Maps confirmed the garbage-ridden lakeside to indeed be the bottom of the trail. 
The path appeared to follow the creek up to a massive rocky ridge that warps around the side of Mount Mason, leading to an overview of the newer, larger lake a few miles over. Finding out where to go was simple enough. I suspected that getting there would not be as such. The Exploration the following Saturday, I managed to gather and prepare four of my friends with which to go out to the old lake. Two of us came with firearms. The other two brought knives and mace. Confident yet anxious, we left the dirty lakeside and headed up, parallel to the creek. The lower part of the trail was lined with a large jutting rocks that formed caves below and continued up the mountainside. These enormous jagged pieces seem to have fallen long ago from the massive ridge above, which topped Mount Mason like a crown. Past the caves and closer to the lowest part of the ridge, the trail aligned into a rocky old creek bed, now diverted and empty. We stopped to rest at the bottom of a switchback, now at high enough elevation to be cradled by a lower portion of the ridge overhanging the trail's connecting elbow. After some respite under the stone's shade, we began our ascent to the top. The path soon wound away from the creek and continued to repeatedly switch back and forth up the side of the steep, stunningly green hill. Studded into the landscape were small scattered stones laid upon by long fallen trees all covered in moss of a believably ancient color. From this point on, the trail was faint but identifiable. Despite the trash at the trailhead, this high up forest looked absolutely untouched. After mounting the hill, we would through thick growth made of a tree I had never seen. Low hanging branches of a round profile surrounded the thin trunk appearing like a cross between a weeping willow and an acorn tree. Besides that, there were quite a few other types of foliage I'd never seen. Once atop the hill, we finally checked in on Google Maps to see how far along the trail we were. To our dismay, we were pinpointed way off the trail on the map. This startled me considering there was only one visible trail along the entire path. What was even more startling is that we ended up on a trail not listed by Google Maps. Admittedly, there wasn't too worrisome since the pathway was fairly defined, despite not seeing much action. We addressed that we should make the best of the situation anyway and press on a little farther to make good use of the remaining daylight. Google Maps showed that we were near a rock-crawling ATV tourist attraction on the state line called Hole in the Rock, a wagon tunnel that cut through the mountain's crown near the top. However, the last and only check-in for the area was five years prior. Apparently, we had found ourselves on an old wagon trail stretching from our side through the tunnel and into the next on the opposite side. The place was old for sure. Exciting was the notion of trekking through an archaic commerce road, passing over the old Native American land of Mount Mason. Interesting stuff. We resolved to find the wagon trail and descend before dark, but we did not make it there in time before so we had to turn around. I'll go ahead and tell you that nothing exciting happened, about which I am both disappointed and relieved. After hiking back down without incident, as expected, we left behind the old lake. It was hard not to dwell upon the chilling isolation felt at Lonesome Creek. The land was empty and quiet, not at all marred by frequent travel. I'm deadly serious when I tell you that this place had a very different energy than your typical nature trail. It evoked an unsettling combination of serenity and oppression. I found it to be the perfect place for strangeness in the primordial wilderness.
Lonesome Creek seemed as isolated from the rest of Arling as Appalachia is to the rest of America. It can be easily ascertained that isolation of the spirit world certainly breed desolation of the soul. Investigation Yesterday, I rang up a lady, we will just call her Marla, whom I have known for quite some time. Marla has been investigating the weird and wild for almost 20 years and has written a few books about local Kentucky myths, folklore, and paranormal stories. She has, with her own resources, even helped find the identity of an early 20th century cold case victim. Conveniently enough, it just also happens that she and her family live about a mile from the old lake. I knew that if anyone could point me to something, it would be Marla. To be quite honest, I did not expect the volume or magnitude of some of the things she told me on that phone call. I have no bias toward the truth of the two stories I've already recounted. This is different to me. I believe this woman with everything in me, and I do not consider myself naive. I will relay to you the information she has given me, which consists of her own experiences as well as the accounts of her family members. I will do my best to tell them faithfully. When Marla married and moved to the Old Lake Road, it seemed nice enough, rural and quiet. She had her first child in 1993, who would grow up to be one of my best friends. When he was barely a toddler, his maternal and paternal grandfathers often took him into the woods across the road from their house, though their family cemetery and up along dirt road. One day, Marlo received a call from her father asking her to tell her F.I.L., who lived on the same property as Marla and her husband, not to take her son to the mountains that day. He said he'd seen some strange folk camping up there who seemed a little suspect. Her father must have been pretty concerned because later that evening, the state police showed up at the cemetery. The authorities informed Marla that they had to run off some people up on the mountain, that they appeared to be trying to set up a site to regularly meet and loiter for whatever purpose. Before leaving the cemetery, the policeman she was speaking to told her plainly, between me and you, they were doing some strange things up there. When pressed, he would not say, just shake his head and decline to answer. About a year later, Marla got the gall to go with her husband up to where the police ran off the loitering creeps. She claims to have found small animal bones scattered around a clearly once established site in a concrete slab fitted into the dirt and etched with what she described as obviously evil symbology. This was a time before cell phones, so she had no photo evidence. Side note, she has also given me permission to check out the area so I may have something tangible for that in the inevitable update post. The next weird experience to befall Marla did not come for another six years. It seemed to have spooked her more than anything else, she has told me. One evening, Marla thought it would be fun to take her son, he was then seven, on a walk at the old lake to check out the creek catch salamanders and fine rocks, as they often did along the river, which runs behind their property. They made their way to the lake and followed Lonesome Creek up towards the initial incline and past the marked WMA area. Apart from the creek babble, Marla caught ear of what sounded like loud voices further into the woods as she and her son continued up to face the second incline, it became evident that a group of people were gathered around Mason's crown. A loud voice echoed from above, booming and fervent, like that of a typical Southern preacher. The voice spoke rapidly, 
and was periodically answered by groups of voices, which spoke in unison. Marla and her son listened closely. The chanting began to cease and everything fell quiet. The eerie silence was broken up by the man's booming voice, angrily shouting in Marla's direction from atop the bridge. Marla grabbed her son and ran all the way back down to the trailhead, fearing that whoever gathered there had seen her and was warding her off like the others. She's never since been back to Lonesome Creek. Years after her experience with the chanting voices, Marla recounted a time her father and father-in-law had been part of something unexplainable when traveling the trail from the Kentucky side of Mount Mason. Though they followed a path that both had walked many times before, the two men became disoriented and got lost. Marla's father said that an anxious feeling washed over him, and suddenly it was as if they simply were somewhere else entirely. They made it home unharmed, and in the amount of time they described as usually short, but were never able to explain the event. It was later realized that they had somehow ended up on the other side of the state line on Mount Mason, way out there. This was not her only account of this phenomenon. Just two years later, after the incident her father described, Two fish and wildlife officials showed up at our house in the middle of basically nowhere. The men admitted that they had no clue where they were. They told Marla that they were trying to get to their destination on the neighbor state side, but somehow became lost and ended up on the Kentucky side. I find it unsettling that despite having maps and being otherwise familiar with their territory, they ended up miles and miles off track. Marla noted that they were visibly shaken by the experience. As time has crept about 20 years past, Marla has searched for answers to her experiences, but has found few. The only presumption she has gleaned is that there have been unexplainable forces in these mountains since they were settled, and probably long before. Appalachia is closely tied with various oddities and old traditions, both good and bad. Benign crowns of witches yet exist within unbroken bloodlines. Wannabe satanic sects composed of lunatics who gain pleasure through infliction of suffering. Old secret societies once prominent but that have since died with coal countries, prosperous towns, dotted across all of rural Appalachia. There is much to be uncovered, and there is even more that should be altogether left alone. Afterward and Continuation If you think about it for a moment, this sort of place really is a perfect hiding place for things of a darker nature. An isolated mountain range with an ancient soul wherein you can find yourself some old secrets you may have been looking for. My dilemma is whether or not trying to find them is a good idea. The things I've written are the only bits of information that Marla has given me relevant to the ill air at Lonesome Creek and Mount Mason. There is such more that she has shared with me regarding other areas in Arling and surrounding counties that I will share within the next I don't know when. I fully intend on going back to follow that stream of Lonesome Creek by myself up the mountain and onto that ridge. I want to be fully prepared to investigate the secrets of the creepy old wagon trail where dark things surely take place. Interestingly enough, I have discovered that a wealthy old family in Arling owns the suspect property along the ridge. Maybe next time, we will find the path to get there.
And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spite, Samantha Blaze, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Chrissy Elias, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Buzz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Kwame Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes, for without you there would definitely not be a me, and Back to Ashes wouldn't exist. Thank you all so much. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.